I always had a dream of owning Ferrari. I've loved Ferrari. My uncle was a race car driver. I followed Formula One racing my whole life. And I always dreamt of owning Ferrari until the day I could afford to buy a Ferrari. And then I'm like, what part of me wants this Ferrari? Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of Affiliate Live. Today I have a guest on the show who's the co-creator and the executive producer of American Ninja Warrior. He started a production company when he was about 40 years old that ended up selling for $100 million. And we get into so much beautiful money mindset information, stories from his personal life and his business life with lots of details. So welcome today, Kent Weed. Hey guys. If you could summarize in five minutes or less what your money mindset is, like how you feel about money. Sure. Well. It and it goes back to when I was a kid. My, my whole concept of money goes back to when I was a kid. And, and when I was very young, my, um, my family was wealthy. My father was somewhat of a, a celebrity in Los Angeles as a, a DJ. Just talking, he was like the Ryan Seacrest of his time, I guess. And, uh, and so we, he, you know, we had celebrities over at our house and, and he made a lot of money. And so we had a lot of things. And then um, that went away. And there was a divorce, a very ugly divorce, and um, the money dried up, and then we didn't have any money. Um, and at what know, age did that happen? That started around ten or eleven. Yeah. So, so I just said I don't know where I got the inspiration or what the the drive, but I said, well, I just have to get a job. I mean, if you want to make money, you have to get a job. If there's no money, you get a job. You make money. So, I started working when I was very young. It, it was a paper route. It was. Um, working at a swap meet on the weekends and saving my money so that I could have things. So that, you know, if I, I didn't have to rely on somebody else to give me something. So it was an early mindset that, that, that was developed. And, and I found that it wasn't that hard. Um, to, to be able to, to go out and just make money wasn't that hard for me. Uh, as I got older, I, I continued working. And, and one of the things my father instilled in me and, you know, there's this whole thing that parents put belief systems on you and stuff. And, and he said, you know, you have to work hard to make it in this world. And you can't trust anybody else and you have to do it yourself. And, you know, I've learned since then that that, you know, may not be the total truth. But it did instill in me a drive to be able to succeed on my own, no matter what I did. And as I, as I grew up, making money wasn't a problem. I was always the, the most wealthy of my family, my siblings, and I always had money. But it didn't come without consequences because I was young and I squandered it when I was in my 20s and basically was bankrupt and in debt you know, by the time I was 23 and had to climb my way out of that. And I went back to my father, can you co-sign a loan for me? And he said, uh, you know what, why don't you talk to my business manager? And I'm like, what the... <laughs> Who, what dad does this? This isn't right. This isn't right, right? I was much more upset at the time, but um, it taught me a lesson. It taught me, well, he was right. I have to do it on my own. Don't can't rely on anybody else. I weathered through that storm and and started my business or started working in the television industry and making money and, and doing very successful. And I worked hard at everything I did. Everything I did, whether it was flipping hamburgers at McDonald's, I wanted to be the best at. It, it was, and that was another thing my dad always said is that. I don't care what you want to do in your life. I don't care what you want to be. I don't care what it is. Just if you want to be a ditch digger, just be the best ditch digger there is that you can be. So I put, I applied that to everything I did, uh, no matter how menial the task may have seemed. And it, it could be as simple as, as doing something, a chore at home or doing the dishes or everything I did very, very well. And, and I pride myself on that. And, and that kind of built um, a character trait in me that was very, um, sustaining throughout my life and, and proved great, you know, results from it. So I, you know, it's funny, a lot of people don't think I'm a money guy because where I, I sit now with money, right? right the, my whole view of money right now is that if you don't worry about it, if you don't think about it all the time, uh, that if you just are conscious that it's easy and it's abundant and you come from a place of abundance, you, you will have all the money you need or the money that you want to have. Uh, and I know that sounds cliche, and I know that sounds very simple, but when you break life down, it can be that simple. It really can. I wasn't always that way. I, I, sh I, w I should say I was always feeling abundant about money and that I would never have a problem making money. But, you know, when I got divorced when, in my 30s, 
I lost everything and everything I owned fit in the back of a Jeep, Grand Cherokee. Well, I had to borrow $400,000 from my future father-in-law to buy, to buy a house because I, I didn't have the money to pay for a house. I paid him off in two years. And yeah, it was so... When, and and $400,000 in what year was this? This was um, about 15 years ago. Yeah. So the equivalent of maybe like 600000 yeah. today? But my, my, my first wife had a double lung transplant. When I married her, she didn't tell me that she had this disease, this condition before we got married. It was pulmonary fibrosis. And she went on, not life support, but breath. She had to be, have a breathing tube for a full time and went on the lung transplant list. And, and they told us it was very experimental, experimental right then. This was 25 years ago. And they, the doctor said, well, the insurance doesn't cover me. And I go, okay, well, how much is the, the, the operation? It's a million dollars. I go... I don't have a million dollars. So I spent the next 14 months taking every director job I could, finding everything I could, and started investing in the stock market. Started getting up at 4.30 in the morning and reading everything, reading trends, studying things, what to invest in, looking for, you know, looking for ways to scale up to you know, exponentially what my earnings were going to be in the next, to be able to pay for this operation. Wow. At the end of 14 months, I had made $980,000. And it was like, this is, I was 30 something years old and it was, uh, you know, just, it's just, you, you don't think about it, you just, about how I'm going to do it. You just do it. And I think just, if you just do it, the rest, it, everything else just comes. It turned out I didn't have to pay for the whole operation. I only had to pay for 750,000 of it. So there was a surplus, which was great. Mm -hmm. And, uh, wish well, she got the divorce later, but that's okay. <laughs> but then after the divorce, I came back again. And I had a company that I had started with my business partner, a television production company. We each put $25,000 in this company with one TV show. At what age? Uh, I was 40 years old. Okay. So this is after you had... So basically, if I'm going to pull back on this a little yeah. bit, you had a bunch of jobs growing up because you went from extreme wealth to losing everything yeah. to being a 12-year-old going to work to stashing away your cash, eventually spending too much around that 23 age, going bankrupt needing to borrow money, right? To get a co-sign a loan from your dad, business manager, all that yeah. stuff went down. Then um, you're going through life, you're putting yourself back together, you're married, you go through a divorce, yeah, and then remarried, and this is the lung issues? The lung issues was the first, my first okay, one. Okay, that was yeah. the first one. So the lung issues, and then you developed this incredible skill set to be able to make a million, basically a million dollars in just over a year. Yeah because of the necessity to pay for it, yeah. right? If there's a need, then... And then you've now, because of that need, you had built this new skill set, right? So that extreme challenge allowed you to step into a space to build all these skills to make that amount of money in that amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. But then those skills come with you after the challenge, right? Right. Which led you to this point of being 40 and now starting a production company. Yes. When I started this company with my partner, I always knew that we'd be successful. I didn't know how. I didn't know how it was going to happen. But I knew that he was smart, I was smart, we were both very good at what we did, and we'd make a good team. And over the next 10 years, we developed 250 shows. Many of them were number one shows on the networks. We did about half a billion dollars in business, and we sold our company for $100 million. In how many years did it take from starting to selling? 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. Okay, so... You start this production company. You both put in $25,000, right? Tell me about the first moves you made. Did you sit down in a strategy session? Did you whiteboard? Like, what was the startup of that looking like? Did you hire people? So the, when we started our company, the strategy behind it was that we wanted to do shows we were passionate about. So you wanted to make TV shows yeah. for network TV? For network TV. Back then, this is, almost, this is 20 years ago, back then... Uh, it was, you know, you, you did shows for TV networks and, and cable was just burgeoning at that time. Okay. Uh, there was no streaming and it wasn't around at that point. Mm -hmm. So, so we had contacts with networks with some of the, our friends had worked at networks. So it's all a contact business and, and we knew we had good ideas. And so we just started developing different show ideas and then selling them to different networks. The, the, the strategy involved was to do shows we were passionate about. And we also were, were very conservative about our money and how we are spending habits. We never took money from the business for our own personal needs. We, we, I don't, 
I, and I always had this beef with my partner because it's like, we have a business. We can write off like dinners and entertainment. And, and he's like, no, that's personal expenses. That's the thing that you need to do for yourself. And, and, and it, it, it proved very you know, fruitful. We, our first hire was our account, accountant. The accountant is the one that manages the money and handles the money and lets you know how you're doing. So we also rented an office, bought some equipment, bought some edit bays, put some edit bays in and so we could save money that way. And we were coming up with strategies to be able to maximize budgets, the, our, our margins, if you will. Uh, and, and so owning equipment was a good thing, not having to outsource a lot of, of jobs. To keeping it in-house was a, a very smart move that we did. And with 50000 to start the business, you were able to do all that? Well, yes. That said, we also had one TV show. Uh, it was called You Gotta See This. It was on Fox Sports. And when you started the company, that was already a thing? Yeah, that was the show that we we inherited, that we got our first show. Beautiful. And so it was like already a, in a season, or it was already pitched? It was It was a show. Well, my business partner had been the head of Fox Sports. He stepped down for the, from there to start this company, and they gave him that show. So that's how we started with that one cable show. Wow. And 165 episodes. It was a strip show. I think, I think it was... Thirty-five or sixty-five thousand dollars an episode. It wasn't a ton of money, but one hundred and sixty-five of them adds up. And it helped pay overhead. It helped give us the resources to develop new shows. Uh, we hired a development person after that, but we had a very small staff. We kept it very lean. One, we shared an assistant, um, so we were very, you know, very frugal about how we spent our money because uh, we knew that it was, you know, the smart thing to do. I mean, that was we both came from the same mindset about that. And, and then, how were both of you? paying your own bills during this period of building it up? Well, we, we had enough money from the business to pay our bills, yeah. Okay, so you were taking paychecks out, yeah. but like not much. Well, the first the first year, I think I made uh, about $700,000. From this business? From this business, yeah. I have so many questions. Yeah. Okay, so where did you get the idea that you wanted to start a production company or a studio or what would you consider this? Well, I had my own production company before this. It was okay. called Wave Productions and I did music videos and dance videos and um, I'd even done some psychic infomercials back then. It was very popular. I did Dionne Warwick and uh, Billy Dee Williams and a bunch of other people, but uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers, a couple, you know, but so it was a pain in the butt to do a production company because there's a lot of managing people is difficult, dealing with clients is is. I was never always, a, I was always I'm more of a director or creator. And, and so dealing with people and being very politically correct and all that, I was not my forte. My partner came from the corporate world. I came from a freelance world. I never had an office in my life until I met him. And now, I'm, now I had to make a commitment to go to work every day with this guy that that's all he's ever known. Mm -hmm. But he lived in this political world with, you know, HR and all this stuff. And I didn't even know what HR was when I first started the company. But <laughs> now everybody knows what HR is. And... So it was a good melding of, of, of mindsets and background. I, so here's the thing. So when I was approached by my partner starting this company, he said, you're crazy. You don't want to do this. And he kept... He said that. No, I did. Oh, you did. Okay. And I said, well, of all the people you could choose, why would you choose me? I go, you have these amazing, all these other you know, executives and people that do stuff. And he's like, why me? He goes, because you're the one that I think I'll succeed with. Hmm. And with your talents, you with your creativity, with you know, what I know about you. Because I had worked... For him, I had done shows for him. He used to call me when they had some mind fuck of a show to do, some logistic nightmare that he had to pull off, and said, "I need your help." And I would come in and figure it out and do it. And so he knew he, he knew that I could I could figure anything out. He knew that I could come in and handle almost anything. And we got along very well too. We were just we saw eye to eye. So so I I kind of kicked and screamed about doing this thing because I didn't want to. And then I realized that I saw a bigger picture. I saw the future. I saw if I want to grow my career exponentially, if I want to do something big, um, it's not going to happen as just being a freelance producer and director, making fees and making, you know, money. And I can make a lot of money that way and I can do a lot of shows and, and get paid a lot for, for my, my work and for my, my skills and everything. But it will never be to the next level. Mm. And I saw this as that. And, but I also saw that it would never be my end game. I was not going to be done. This would be the last thing I did. Uh, to that point, when we came time to put the name on the company, originally it was going to be called Smith & Weed Productions. And then my part, Arthur came to me and he said, you know, I really, really want my name on the, on the door. I always had this dream of my name being on the door. And I want to call it the Arthur Smith Company. I go, well, 
where, where am I? <laughs> well, we're partners. How does, and so it didn't, didn't make sense to me. And some of that's ego. But I also knew that having your name on the door brought with it a certain level of responsibility. And, and I knew that there would come a time when I would want to step out and step down. I knew this way back then. Oh, yeah. And, and I said, okay. So we came up with a, a compromise. It was called A. Smith & Co. I was the co. That was always the joke. I was the co. Hmm. And, you know, for me, that was okay. I was never really a front man. He, was, he liked the limelight. He had been a network president, and he, he'd always been kind of in front of the camera. I was behind the camera. I was the director, the creator. I liked, you know, being the guy pulling the strings and doing all this stuff and, and not taking, you know, all the, the fame and glory that surrounded it. So, so it, was, it was okay with me. When we started, I, I said, okay, we'll do this. And I said, I'm going to have to work on a desk. I'm going to have to go to work every day. And, and I just said, That's, this is what you have to do if you want to go big. And if you want to go to the next level. I had no idea that 10 years later we'd sell the company for $100 million. There was no way of knowing it. But I knew somewhere inside me that if I was going to go big, this was, this was the shot to do it. And I knew he was the guy to do it with. And How did you know? Was it a feeling that you had? Just a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. I knew him well. I knew that he'd been very successful in, in everything he'd done and he'd risen to the top. He'd been a president of um, Fox Sports. He was a vice president at Universal. And he'd always, you know, was very well respected in the community and he had lots of contacts. And I just knew that this was the pers perfect person to partner with. We did develop great shows together, like I said. And to the point that we, you know, became in a, in a time when all the smaller independent companies were getting bought up. We got approached many, many times. Uh, and we turned down a couple of offers too because we didn't want the partnerships mm. with a couple of the companies, a couple of the European companies. We said, mm, I don't think that works. And we, you know, we finally, you know, we, we, had, our, we had our ups and downs though. Uh, um, about year seven, we were doing a couple of shows. We did one show in Japan. It was the first television series ever shot on... American show ever shot on, on the full show shot in Japan, in Tokyo. It's called I Survived a Japanese Game Show. We did two seasons on ABC. It was a great fun show. We kidnap people in America. We bring them to Japan. We put them on a game show. And you know, Japanese game shows are crazy, fun, mm -hmm. colorful, mm -hmm. messy, dirty, you know. And in the process of doing that show, we did another show called Crash Course, which was Wipeout with Cars. We built these huge, oversized obstacles, like giant bowling pins, and the cars would crash into them. We, and... And the show was really fun, really entertaining. Um, it, it got killed by Obama doing some speech in September and we got lost the episodes, but we ended up selling internationally and did much better than domestic. But, and I think someone just, oh, it's in Denmark right now, of all places. So. But where I was going is that when we did these two shows, our person that was in charge of the money, our, we, you have a line producer or executive in charge of production that handles the budgets. And... At this point, I had loosened up the reins a little bit. I used to monitor everything. I used to sign every check. I used to see every budget, check every budget, make sure everything was staying on track to protect ourselves. But I had built up trust in this one person and, and we were very busy and I, and I had to pull myself away and delegate so that I could concentrate on, because I was directing and producing both these shows amongst other shows, because um, I directed almost every show that we did. Out of the 150? Out of the 150 at that time. Wow. And so... He had gone over budget and he approached me when he, I think I, I got a little problem. We're like $300,000 over budget on this show. I go, what's the relativity of that? So if he's 300,000 over budget, what was the budget supposed to be? So the budget on that show was 3 million. Okay. So he went 10% over. 10% over at this time. It, it ended up escalating, blowing up to a million dollars. So here's the thing. When you have a problem and you keep it to yourself, it's your problem, right? And nobody else can help you with that problem. So the only way to, to, to help is to reach out to other people, right? So when he told us, it was too late to tell the network that there's a problem because it was in the past. You have to give people warnings, right? If, if you say to the network, hey, listen, costs are going over. If you want this, you need to pay that. You know, if you want to be able to, you know, but if you do it after the fact, they go, well, I didn't know there was a problem. That's your problem. So we were stuck holding the bag for a million dollars. But that wasn't all of them. He did the same thing on I Survived a Japanese Game Show to a tune of 1.3 million. So all of a sudden we found ourselves in this year $2.3 million in debt. And most companies would have had to shut their doors. 
we came up with a plan. I had a very good relationship with a company, Taiyo Kikuku, who does, who is the Japanese company that was our partners for I saw our Japanese game show. And they liked us and they wanted to get into, they produced a lot of commercials and some content in Japan, but they wanted to get in the, into the United States market. We came up with a plan, we devised a plan where they would invest in our company. They would give us a million dollars and we would develop a show together and then help sell content for them, give them a foothold in the United States. So this helped, right? We got an immediate cash influx to help offset that debt. Now, did you come up with that plan because of the debt? Yes. Okay. Wow. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. And it, it was nothing's ever easy and it's not simple to cut and dry as that. It took months to do, but, but we pulled it off. And, and that was a very big help in, into us, you know, climbing out of that, that pit. I think in ABC ended up giving us a few hundred thousand, uh, but they weren't happy. And, you know, you, you have a, um, a reputation, you know, that you, and peop, you, know, you only get hired because you do good work, you deliver, you execute well, not just creatively, but budgetarily as well. So that, you know, ups and downs like that all the time. There's always, there's always, always problems in any business and being creative and how you deal with them and how you handle them rather than just going down a dark hole and, and it's like, oh no, oh me, oh, oh and worrying and, and about it is, it's really the key to surviving and, and coming out stronger, smarter, and, and, and better than before. We had our best year the year after. So tell me these ups and downs that you went through in business, did you have any ups and downs in your personal life? Oh yeah. I, I, at that time, you know, I had gone through a lot with my first wife uh, because of the, the illness. And, and after she got her lung transplant, she was very afraid to do anything, to go anywhere. She, she really kind of stayed in a box, which um, put a lot of stress on her relationship. And she just became a different person. And I probably never really got over the fact that I was kind of deceived, you know. Here, you marry someone, you think you're spending the rest of, life or rest of your life with them, and then a year later, you, all of a sudden, they're on oxygen 24 hours a day, and they have this pulmonary fibrosis. Like, what? Where did that come from? And it's, it's a condition she had. So. so I'm sure there was something to that. And, I, you know, we, we went on to have a child because she wanted to have a child. And, and, and I'm doing all this, by the way. After. After this, yeah. By the way, doctor said, don't have a child. Don't do this. Don't get a dog. First, we had a dog. Don't get a dog. We got a dog. First, have a child. Get, don't have a child. Get a child. Have a child. And all this was I was doing because, not because I wanted a dog, not because I wanted a child, but because I wanted to make her happy. I wanted, you know, here I am picturing this person. Back then, the, the life expectancy of someone that has a double lung transplant was only five years. But here's the funny thing. Technology, medicine, science is advancing, you know, almost at a disruptive rate right now. And so as she lasted longer, medicine got better and extended her life longer and longer. She's still alive today, 25 years later, and probably one of the top 10 survivors in, in, of a double lung transplant at this point. But um, it just added a lot of stress and pressure to our relationship. I became this, you know, you know, there's a totem pole. And I became the guy at the bottom holding everything up. And I would just, there was, it just was, I felt that you know, the only thing that was working in my life was work. The only thing was my business. And, and I was still staying in shape, still athletic. I've always stayed athletic. I always exercised. That was my outlet too. Exercise, whether it was triathlons or finding some sort of competition or some sort of regular routine or challenge to keep me fit. Um, and I felt good too. I always felt good, you know. I, and so those were my two outlets. And, but I wasn't happy at home. And a couple of things happened. My father died. And my father was in a very unhappy second marriage, and I, to this day, believe that it, that's what ended up killing him, that, wow. that he didn't have a way out, that he's gonna take the easy way out, the respectable way out, I'll just get cancer. And then everyone will feel sorry for me. I'll, I'll bow out gracefully, and I won't have to divorce this witch of a woman that I'm married to, and go be happy. Um, and, and it kind of like clicked in my head that, you know, I have a, a choice here, I can be happy. Or I could stay doing this, which is not, going to be happy and it's not going to change because she's not going to change and I'm you know we can't change other people I can change me I can change and so to everybody's uh chagrin and much dismay um I I, I divorced my wife and basically said this is enough's enough and I gotta go live my life and be happy the 
my whole family th was said, you can't do this. This is the worst thing. Everybody, you know, this is, she's ill. She's sick. She's like, in this like, and it was, you know, I, it was a very, very difficult time because I was the bad guy. Mm -hmm. But I knew what I was doing was right. It was really right for both of us, for us to, to separate and go live our lives, you know, her to do what she needed to do and me to, to, to go and be happy and find happiness. The, we'd separated in that, the final straw that broke the camel's back or decision was my younger brother died of a heart attack. And then like, okay, these are some pretty extreme signs I'm getting. Okay? Yeah. If I'm not going to listen to these, I, I don't know. You, you can hit me over the head how many times before I like go, okay, I get it. So um, that was like, okay, I'm done. And four years in court and lots and lots of money and all that stuff. And um, she hired, you know, like, the Beverly Hills attorney and all that stuff. And, and you know, and her attorney did good. She cleaned me out and they painted me out to be this terrible father and terrible husband and all this stuff. And I even had to bring in, uh, um, they said I was an absentee father and I never did anything with our son. And I had to bring in all these pictures and all this stuff of, as proof to the court. I said, look, I have nine plaques here from soccer and baseball as me as the coach of his team. Here's a video of me showing him how to learn, learn teach him how to ride a bicycle. Here, you know, I'm showing all this stuff. Like that, this is what an absentee father does. You know, it's like, so those are, those are really tough times. But some of the hardest decisions free you up to do amazing things and, and to live your happiest life. And when you have something like that holding you back in your relationship, it does spill over into other areas of your life, without a doubt. It's, you know, it's, it, I've, I've learned as I've gotten older, and this comes as true with money or relationships, balance is, is, is the key. And... It was one of the things my uncle said before, before, like almost the day before he died. He said, if I can tell you anything, he was 84 years old. And it's balance. Finding balance is the key. You know, people tell you compassion, balance, they're, they're, they all play a, a huge role. And, and so I've, I've, I've found a way to, to create balance in my life, to balance family and relationships. And so after we sold the company, um, I thought we did it. I got the brass ring, hundred million. By the way, a hundred million dollars, since this is about money, doesn't translate to a hundred million dollars. So there's two of people, course. okay? <laughs> so right away, half of it's gone, mm -hmm. okay? Then there's government, mm -hmm. they oh, take yeah. half, right? <laughs> okay. Then there's the brokers that brokered the deal, the business managers, the agents, the lawyers, right? Ding 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 ding. ding. All of a sudden, you're you go. How did how did like fifty million dollars turn into twenty? So, uh, but it does, and hey, listen, I was still happy, and, and then it became, okay, now what's next, you know, and uh, now, I'm, now I'm an employee again. Now I'm working, not for myself, and I found that I became very unhappy with work, and, I, and very, not depressed, but I just didn't enjoy it anymore. And, and to I, be clear for people that don't understand this, when you sell the company like that to a much larger company, they usually have you sign an agreement to stay on for a correct. while. Correct. It's called an earn-out agreement. Mm -hmm. Ours was a little structured a little bit differently. It was based on loan notes and we actually owned a piece of the whole company. So me and my partner owned nine and a half percent of this whole company, and which was about four or 500 million at that time. And so, but we had to, there was like a five year earn out period. And at that time they would do, there'd be another event where they would sell off the assets to another private equity firm or another big corporation. And that time came and, and it didn't happen. And they only gave us half our money in the beginning. The other half was when these called loan notes. Now loan notes is a really tricky thing. And if anybody ever asks you about entering into a deal with loan notes, run away. Ooh. Run okay. away as fast as you can. Okay. It's, it's a terrible idea. It only works if the end justifies the means. And, and, and the end has to justify the means by having an event at the end of five years. Here's the problem with loan notes. You basically get income called phantom income from these loan notes. You don't get any cash, but you, on paper, you've made $150,000 this year. You have to pay taxes on that. So now you're paying half, you know, 50% taxes on the phantom income, which you're not getting. It's, in a, it's part of a loan note on the interest for the loan notes, because there's a, 
You're not paying on the loan, so you're paying on the interest on the loan. It's like a promise of if there's a future sale, you will get paid out of that sale. Right. And it's stacking and it has interest, which is attractive. Right. And the interest is great because... If that happens. Yes, if it happens. But if, it, if there's no event, there's no, you know, 100% of nothing is nothing. That said, you're still paying the government on exactly. this phantom income. So imagine making How is that legal? a million dollars a year and then... 150,000 of that is not cash. So now I made 850,000, but I got to pay 75,000 on that phantom income. So now I've made 775,000. So it decreases your, your income by almost 25%. Mm. Uh, so this put a lot of strain and stress on, on our relationship as a partnership and, and a need to try and do more business and create more work and, and the company that we work for, everything was about margin. When you, when you stop working for yourself and work for someone else, you know, there's a bureaucracy involved, there's, you know, a board involved, and, and everything's driven by profits, like all big business. So what are your margins? Can you get your margins up? You need to save costs. And it's like, you know, we'll just sell another show. And remember when I said we started the business because we wanted to do shows we were passionate about? Well, all of a sudden, we're doing projects that I, I have no interest in doing at all. I, I mean, it's like, this is, this is not move the needle for me. It's not helping humanity. It's not making a difference in the world. It's just, I mean, it wasn't, you know, Jersey Shore, thank God. And it wasn't The Bachelor, but, but it still wasn't, it was somewhat mindless television stuff. So, so it was purely for profit, purely just doing it for money, just to make money. And that's not what I had signed up for. I became very disillusioned with the company after five years, and my partner said, "Hey, the earnout's not happening. The, the, the event's delayed. You know, we've been fielding offers, and but you know, it's not happening. Can you stay on for another two years?" "No, I can't." Um, I can st and I said, "I'll stay on for a year. We'll figure out a transition. We'll find someone else to be the president of the company. We'll find someone to to help with the transition. But I got I got to segue out because I want to do something more. I want to do something different." So another time, this is the second time in my life when everybody says, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you have a, I mean, you have this seven-figure deal, high seven-figure deal. It's like, and you're, you're, you're throwing it away. You make millions of dollars a year as a salary. And you're, what are you going to do? I go, I don't know. And so what were, I have two questions. What were your expenses for your daily life when you quit the company? Like, did you need to make that much to just cover your costs of living? Uh, yes and no. So by the time I, I left the co quit the company, I was remarried. I had two kids. Um, my wife had... Is this three kids total now? Three kids total, yeah. So I have an eight and a 10-year-old. It's going to be 11. And then I have a 21-year-old that's in SMU in Dallas. Right now? Right now. Congratulations. Yes, yeah, thank you. Now it's, it's a blessing. It's beautiful and I love it. And I get to spend so much time with my kids now that's... That's what it's all about. So, uh, yeah, I, I had the expenses, so I still had to figure out a way to make money. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh, I can just kick my heels off and retire and just live off the interest in the bank. And it wasn't that way. Were you still playing in the stock market at this point from the skills oh, yeah. you had learned? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've always played. I, I have up until about three years ago, I was very active in, in the stock market and had done very well in the stock market. Um, I, I studied trends. Uh, and I'm always looking for what's the next thing that's going to um, disrupt. And so, and I made some bad investments, but I made some home run investments too. I got involved with Tesla before Tesla was anybody who knew what Tesla was other than Nicholas Tesla. Like pre-IPO? Oh yeah. Yeah, pre-IPO. And I was involved with the IPO as well. So, but uh, yeah, pre-IPO, I, I, I had bought or put my down payment on the Tesla Roadster. Mm. So, you know, I knew about Elon way before when he was designing the car and he had to fly the body over from England because the body was made by Lotus originally. Mm -hmm. um, so I got into Tesla very early and I tell, I don't tell a lot of people, but I'll tell you what she's telling a lot of people now <laughs> is Tesla paid for all my cars, mm. the, the stock. I mean, I made, you know, a killing in the Tesla stock. Yeah. And if you're still holding it at all right now, it's just, yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, you know, Amazon was another big early purchase. Netflix, I got in real early because I saw Netflix as the future. Mm -hmm. One of the things I did at my company prior to leaving, which was probably the, the catalyst for which drove me out um, in year three of my five year earnout, I went to my partner and I said, I'm not happy. I need to do something. And I said, I have this idea. I want to create a digital vision. 
because I see this world going towards streaming. Mm. Um, and this was early on. This is before you know the Amazons and, and before Netflix even was really going, taking off. And um, but uh, he said, "Oh, okay." So he gave me a couple of people, you know, and we agreed. And he, he saw it as a way to, to appease me and keep me on and keep me happy. And so I started this digital company and uh, side of our show or side of our business, I should say, um, which was built upon a model where you take IP. And then you kind of figure out a way to monetize that IP. The key was to own the IP. And this is what our company was doing wrong, is we were just doing guns for hire and giving our IP away to networks and letting them pay licenses. Like, we have to own our IP. We did it right once, which um, we, there was a show called Full Throttle Saloon. It was on for seven seasons on TNT, I think. And it was about the Sturgis bike rally. And someone came to me and said, there's this huge bike rally in this, this bar that's open, you know, like 10 days a year and they make like $2 million. It's crazy. And everybody sends on this small town. It's a, it's crazy. You got to come see it. So, so checked it out and they said, it's happening like in a month and, and we should film it and all this stuff. And I, so I convinced my partner to put $200,000 in and I said, the worst case scenario is if we don't sell it, we'll make a documentary out of it. We'll make our money back. It'll be fine. Well, we went, we shot it. We got amazing footage. We ended up selling the series and did seven seasons with it, but we owned the IP. So we were able to, to make money on the back end with other, other areas, with, with talent and with merchandise and even with music. Um, one of the things I did with our company was to um, create two music publishing companies. And then I would make a deal with composers saying, I will give you, you know, do this show for me uh, and we'll split the publishing. So we put all your music on our shows and we split the publishing. Even down to even down to the logo music that plays on our on our logo at the end of the show, you know we get like three hundred bucks every time our, one of our shows plays, you know, and and so finding ways to monetize IP or to create to ownership was the key to growing and, and making money, uh, and not being reliant on someone else just paying you fees. So so I took that kind of a model, created this digital plan, which was this three sixty model, which is the IP is in the middle, and then you have many different ways to monetize it, whether it's music publishing, whether it's talent management, whether it's a graphic design part. Could you give me an example of a specific show that you worked with and how you did that? Um, I probably, I can't because the show never happened because of corporate issues. So I took this plan to my partner after developing it and, and I met with the guys at Zell it and, 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 when I went up to the board of directors, they said, you know, I, I don't see this working. You know, we, we sell shows to networks mm. and we, we, we get paid by networks to do shows. Why would we do this? Why would we invest our money? Why would, and they didn't see the long tail aspect of it. They didn't see the benefits of what year is this in? This was 2015. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is like a thing now that other people have oh, done. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. Massively. Yeah. It's a, it's the same model that I'm using or plan to use with Eric and with John and Marissa too, mm -hmm. um, to retain the IP. Um, Can you talk about that? Like what you're seeing for the future of what you're trying to get into next? One of the things that I, I wanted to do when I left the company was to continue, continue using my talents, but to do projects that I was passionate about, projects that I thought moved the needle. Uh, American Ninja Warrior, I retain, I still executive produce that show and I, I also exec produce and direct the American Ninja Warrior Junior show. And those, that's a show that exemplifies something that's inspirational, that um, moves the needle for people, that, that, that makes a difference. It changes people's lives. I, I say it all the time. It gets parents off the couch and gets kids away from video games and everybody playing together like a family in the backyard again. And I mean, that's what we're missing in, in today's world is more programming that is inspiring us to, to be you know, loving, caring, supporting each other, being a stronger community. American Ninja Warriors community is probably the strongest community of tribe of people that support each other that, that I know of right now. Bobby, I mean, I mean they're, they, they are equivalent to like Mind Valley or Summit or all these other groups that, that create communities of people that support each other's goals and aspirations. And the funny thing about American Ninja Warrior is like, they, it's a competition, but each one's helping each other out. You know, how do you, how did you do this one, this obstacle different and how can I get better? It's a, it's a family like none I've seen. So I really wanted to do more shows like that, more content that was like that, more content that's going to help people. 
And when I put it out there into the universe, it just started coming to me. I mean, when I say it came to me, people approached me and say, hey, this is so-and-so, and this is so-and-so, and he's got this. And I go, well, Wild Fit would help people. That, I could see doing a show kind of like a big brother on Wild Fit. And we, we take the same model as Ninja Warrior. Like Ninja Warrior, there's 100 people that run the course. You see 20 on TV. So we take Wild Fit, and we take 40 people, and we put them through program. We follow 10. And we dive deep into their lives and get their backstories and what brought them there and how important this is. And we, 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 we interview the, the family aspect and the, the people that surround them, the friends and family, how it affects them. And becomes relatable to everybody then. People, someone can identify with somebody in that group, whether it's the person going through it or the person's friend or the person's family. And by having 10 different people, you have 10 different stories and there's always something relatable for, some, for an audience. And they see something in that person. They go, you know what? If they can do it, I can do it just like Ninja Warrior. So that's the kind of projects that I'm looking at now. With John and Marissa, uh, what she's doing is, is amazing. I mean, she's helping transform people's lives. And people like to see transformation. And transformation works because it's inspirational and people see themselves in those people being transformed. They say, maybe I can transform myself. If they can do it, I can do it. So I, I wanna do stuff that hits people here and makes people feel and gets people off the couch and gets people to shake out their normal things and you know unplug from the matrix and, and jump into their lives. And what I've learned is that you know when it comes to money, uh, I disassociate my fear with it. And you know, it's not always easy because it does sneak in. You know, it's hard not to avoid when the stock market crashes 1,200 points and, and drops 5%. And you know that you have a lot of money in the stock market. So do I look at the, you know, what my bank account is there? No, because I know that it's a trend and everything has cycles and everything goes up and it goes down and up and goes down. If I was taking my money out today, yeah, that might be a concern, but I'm not. So it's still all just in the ethos right now. And, so why worry about something that's not real, basically? Um, and let's talk about that. So making it not real, what would be your biggest money habits that you have kept? So for instance, like you said, you don't need to take that money out today, which is why it's not so fear-based yeah. and, and you don't have to worry about it because you are doing some in the stock market and then keeping some liquid and savings and keeping your earnings high. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. What are the biggest like, tips you could give on that? I think the key is to be, you can be smart about money. You don't have to be fearful of it, but you still need to be smart. Mm -hmm. So I don't spend excessively. Uh, I do value experiences. I do value trips. Any money I've ever spent on a trip or experience has brought dividends. Buying stuff, not so much. Uh, buying a fancy car, it, it, it comes and goes. Buying the you know the new the biggest house on the block or the the fanciest house is, yeah, that's that's the stuff that you know really doesn't equate to me. It doesn't it doesn't it it's not smart money use. You know, I also I'm conscious how I spend my money, and I'm not just flagrant about it. I'm not you know so I I I, I have always been conscious about it. not out of fear though, just being it feels like being smart because do I need this? Mm. Where is it coming from? You know, ex buying experience has value beyond belief because spending, spending, time, spending time with your friends and family, that's, those are creating life memories. And I don't, you know, buying something, I don't remember having a memory of buying something and, and cherishing that memory. You know, I always had a dream of owning Ferrari. I've loved Ferrari. My uncle was a race car driver. I followed Formula One racing my whole life. And I've always dreamt of owning Ferrari until the day I could afford to buy a Ferrari. And then I'm like, what part of me wants this Ferrari? And, and it, was, it, was, it was a different me. It's not the me who I am today. Um, could I buy a Ferrari? Sure, I could buy a Ferrari. And, and yeah, I'd love it for five minutes, you know, not maybe longer than five minutes, but, <laughs> but, but I don't need it. And it doesn't, it doesn't bring me joy. It doesn't bring me, it doesn't, I don't, I don't need to prove anything to anybody. And that's not, you know, um, so, so it's a different, you different, it's a different mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have the, 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 the best house or the best furniture or the, 
or the fanciest this and you know that stuff's all nice but you know it's not always the stuff that you know moves the needle will i do it because my wife wants something yeah i'll do it you know to because it's she's in a different place than i am and things are more important to her than, than to me uh, we just had this not an argument but a discussion about this at christmas that you know those little hoverboards it was like so um there the kids w had one but it, it blew up it caught fire and so we had to get a new one so we got one for christmas for them to share and she said you want to get two i was like no i don't want to get two one's enough one's plenty because they can share i like promoting sharing i like that kind of mindset that it teaches them it's a skill set about sharing mm -hmm. and and then like a month later like in february all of a sudden there's another hoverboard in our house it's like where did this come from well i know we talked about it but i thought two was better i go but what happened to the whole share conversation so so people are different do, mm -hmm. do i get upset about that no because life's too short and you know there's bigger bigger things to deal with but uh, i think so so being conservative with your money to a point of not being extravagant with something that doesn't bring value to your life or to your soul. And then not always worrying about money, but having a plan about money is important. So, you know, when I, knew, when I left my company and I knew that I wasn't going to be making, you know, a million, two million dollars a year, I knew that, you know, well, I'm going to make some money because I'm still doing some shows. Uh, so I have to figure out other ways to make money if I want to keep growing my, my wealth so that one day I don't have to even work and even think about it. And, and that's still a goal of mine. And, and that takes a certain amount of money. You have to have a certain amount of money in your bank so you can make interest, so you can live off your, your fixed income. And, and, you know, I need, you know, you need 50, $100 million would, would set you, but you'd probably be fine with 20 or 30 million. So, um, but my wife's ex expensive, so. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got different levels, right? Yeah, there's different levels, so. And I have a big, you know, I have a big nut because the kids are in private schools. I've got, you know, a couple of homes. But so everybody has different. But mm -hmm. find out what your tolerance is. Find out what you need and make a plan for it. And and don't stress on it. And then I really believe that if you just make a plan, things happen. And be patient. Mm -hmm. You got to be patient with money. You can't have it now. You can get it, but it may not always come now. I have like a gazillion more questions and I hope we can do this again. Yeah. And, I, and I have questions about so many other areas of life too, that it's just such a gift to have you here and to be um, close as friends that we can have these conversations and other people can benefit from it. So thank you for coming over My and pleasure. I'm super excited to have more conversations about all of this on or off camera. <laughs>